Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So today I want to ask the question, will the first commercial exotic vacuum object device compete with batteries or generators? So I first came across the term exotic vacuum object in 2016 when I came across the work of uh, Ken Shoulders. I was a bit surprised that this wasn't discussed more in the condensed matter nuclear science and low energy nuclear reaction research field, but when I started really delving into what I saw, I realized that pretty much every form of anomalous effect could be explained by these so-called exotic vacuum objects, which Ken Shoulders originally called charge clusters. Uh, he called them charge clusters uh, after he called them electron validium, which are like strong electrons. So uh, they can often grab ions, and uh, therefore you have ions and electrons, so that's a charge cluster. But then uh, they seem to do things that uh, were a little bit more out of the ordinary and uh, form structures. And so he called them uh, exotic vacuum objects, uh, ultimately. So uh, it was in 2017 where I really started to talk about this in public, uh, particularly uh, during my um, uh, first quarter visit to Suhas Ralkar in India, where I gave a presentation uh, to people from the Babur Atomic Research Center in the Mumbai University there. And it was after that I could really start talking about this work. And at some point after that, I uh, came across an interview uh, between Nancy Lazarian, who is John Hutchison's wife, John Hutchison and Ken Shoulders. And I did a uh, transcript of that, which I published on the MFMP's Steemit channel. I just want to draw out this question and answer. This is the question from Nancy Lazarian. What's the positive things it can be used for, it being exotic vacuum objects? And Ken Shoulders uh, replied, you name something that you want, that you need to be good, and it'd probably be the thing that does it for you. So, uh, I am effectively asking here, uh, can it compete with batteries or generators? What will be the first product uh, to come out of this? Well, in research uh, on exotic vacuum objects, I happened to chance upon uh, a web page for something that might get us closer to answering this question. And what I will also do is I will expand upon some things that I uh, first introduced at ICCF 22 last year uh, that no one has really picked up on uh, the significance of what I've said there. And I will also relate it back to the work of Alexander Parkamov in this book that he produced, Space, Earth, Human, New Views on Science, and uh, how we can maybe leverage something that could be a battery to enable... Uh, something that may even do some generation functions. Okay, so what did I come across? I came across this website. The title of the website is Free L Tech, and it's a play on the word Free Electron Tech. And the website domain is freel.tech. Now, all the links will be in the description of the video below. So uh, this is apparently a new form of capacitor uh, that uh, in uh, the sort of second quarter of 2017 was picked up as a technology that had already been patented by some Russian researchers. So um, essentially, when I'm looking through this, uh, I'm seeing some striking claims here. It's saying that uh, it can be long-lasting, eco-friendly, powerful, and scalable, and very high density of up to 20,000 watts, that's 20 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So one kilogram can store, it's claimed, 20 kilowatt hours. And this is apparently 100 times that of the capability of lithium iron. Now, <clears throat> the... Not so surprising thing is, if we listen to uh, Ken Shoulders, is you name something you want, that you need to be good, and it'll probably be the thing that does it for you. Well, what do we see here? Right at the top, we see charge clusters. And if we go there, 
it talks about charge clusters and Ken shoulders and the fact that uh, they can store a lot of electrons in these uh, so-called uh, tori, these uh, O-shaped uh, objects. And it even has publications here, including Ken Shoulder's EV, A Tale of Discovery, and uh, several of his most important uh, papers right here on this page. I'm absolutely astounded. Uh, and so if you look at the team here, uh, it seems to be two guys that uh, have some, uh, look like a father and son team, but uh, uh, they also look like they might have some military uh, experience. There's like a, a, a business plan, investor, guy, and also there's a guy uh, called Roman Koloshenko. And this guy here is the guy that uh, he said he wor worked in the USSR uh, forces in the late 1980s, including in hotspots, blah, 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 blah. And uh, then he started investigating this concept called vacuum capacitor. Now, as you may know, you have things like these supercapacitors from graphene sheets, you have uh, electrolytic capacitors, and you have uh, dielectric sort of charging polarization capacitors. And those are the normal type of capacitors. And what it seems that he has achieved here is something called a vacuum capacitor. And what they are saying is the way that it works is it produces a whole bunch of charge clusters that sit in this vacuum and then that energy, that stored free electron uh, energy can be drawn down uh, at a later time. This is absolutely amazing. So there is a patent. In fact, there's a series of patents that were uh, awarded in a number of countries. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the US patent. Uh, it says here, data patent May 26, 2015. And you can see that there is some priority. Uh, and this, I think, was in uh, Russia, there were some patents uh, uh, of, in this related area filed on September the 9th, 2010. So it, this is even before I really started uh, getting involved with Lena. But <laughs> unlike, it would seem, the Western Lena and condensed matter nuclear science field that really were not, as far as I could see, exploring the work of Ken Shoulders, obviously people in Russia were doing that. Now, I'm going to pull out some several parts of uh, this uh, patent, uh, and I'll just read the, the headline here, uh, the ab abstract headline here. Uh, the vacuum capacitor comprises an anode arranged outside a vacuum chamber in which a cathode is arranged as, a, as well as a dielectric. Between said cathode and anode, said cathode can be designed in such a way that it can be heated by means of an electrically insulated filament disposed in the vacuum chamber, said vacuum chamber being in the form of a dielectric hermetically sealed cylinder, and said anode is arranged on the outer surface of the dielectric hermetically sealed cylinder. The cathode can be a cold cathode with a micropeak type surface, which enables the loss of free electrons from the surface thereof without any heating. And the anode is located on the outer surface of the dielectric cylinder with a high vacuum and a cathode arranged therein. So um, I have annotated the drawings here uh, to make this a little bit easier to uh, share with you. And essentially, uh, there's two types. Uh, there is one where you have basically um, a heater element in here, and this is the cathode. This area here around there is a dielectric insulator. Now, I would suggest that if this is going to be effective, this should not be an ionic ceramic, like alumina. We established that all of those ionic uh, uh, ceramics become conductors uh, when you get over a sort of a thousand degrees and this is something that is the basis of an Ernst lamp. So I would suggest that uh, if this was going to be very good you would want this when it's in concert with a, a heater element here to be something like boron nitride and so that is my suggested thing. It's not said in the patent but I would suggest this would be a boron nitride ceramic ideally if you're not heating this up so much, then maybe that's not so important because you haven't got that thermal issue. And then you have this anode on the outside. So there is a vacuum area in this area here, 
and this is supposedly where the charge clusters, the exotic vacuum objects, are stored. Although we do know from Ken Shoulder's work that he says they get stored in the metals. Well, the only metal would be the cathode. And in fact, you charge this by putting high voltage into the cathode and you discharge it uh, by taking the power from the cathode. So a lot of negative free electrons cluster themselves in here or let's say maybe in the, the metal of the cathode and you're able to draw upon them at a later time. Now uh, one can say that the electric uh, filament cathode heater here uh, would promote uh, thermionic emission from the cathode and the um, uh, the cold cathode version uh, would use just the high voltage and some spikes and the spikes themselves uh, would uh, produce these exotic vacuum objects, these electron clusters from the, the space charge around the spike uh, and, and then oscillations or, or, or just uh, gets to a critical point and then it, it breaks the EVO away. Anyway, so there's a number of ways that I could consider to improve this and I will talk about the at the end and some uh, ways that this could uh, uh, even potentially become a generator. So I'm just going to talk through um, a little bit that I've highlighted in here. Uh, so he says, the essence of the inventive model is that it allows the building of a small size electric energy accumulation systems of large capacitance and voltage. Now, he did a test here. He says, to confirm theoretical ideas for a vacuum capacitor and to determine the electrical capacitance of the vacuum in it, an experiment was carried out in which a 6D6A electro vacuum diode with approximately an inner volume of 2.3 centimeters cubed was used as a vacuum capacitor. For this purpose, a 6D6A diode was placed into a metal beaker filled with transformer oil to have its own anode insulated. The beaker formed the anode of the vacuum capacitor, VC. The cathode could be heated using a filament transformer with an effective voltage of 6.3 volts. The capacitor was charged using rectified mains voltage, i.e. approximately 310 volts, via a current-limiting alternative resistor and an ammeter. Using these devices, a direct 10 milliamp current was maintained for eight hours. In eight hours, the voltage between the metal beaker, the anode, and the cathode of the 6D6A diode reached 28 volts. Now, he does some uh, calculations up here, and he calculates, uh, in short, and in Russian terms, it's uh, the comma is actually the decimal point. So this is at 10.2857 farads. And this implies that the electrical capacitance of a one cubic centimeter of vacuum measured with this method is in excess of five farads per one cubic centimeter, while the operating voltage measures several tens of kilovolts. None of the existing capacitors can achieve this range. So typically, high farad capacitors uh, that you would get uh, would like super capacitors, they would have very, very low voltages. So this is both uh, a small package with a high farad and a very high voltage capability. So, consequently, it may be used as an energy accumulator which requires little time to get charged and then the accumulated energy may be discharged under any operating conditions suitable for energy storage systems for diverse purposes. One wonders whether this might be related to the observation by Lyon of the lighting of a halogen light bulb post his experiment where the exotic vacuum objects were stored in the reactor's structure. Anyway, industrial applicability. The vacuum charging process using a special charging device emitting free electrons similar to the voltage multiplier in vacuum tubes not shown in the drawing. So maybe this is something a bit like a Cockcroft-Walton voltage multiplier. A negative voltage is generated on the cathode relative to the anode which causes an emission of free electrons from the cathode into the vacuum. The electrons, which tend towards the anode, cannot reach it because the hermetically sealed dielectric cylinder is on their path. Therefore, they accumulate in the vacuum. Kind of, kind of like static electricity. While new free electrons continue to arrive from the cathode, forming a bulk charge around the cathode. This process continues until the voltage of the electric field of the bulk charge becomes level with the voltage of the charging device. When this happens, the charging of the vacuum capacitor is complete. So that's basically describing how it's uh, 
operating and essentially the rest is what I've described. This is a four, one, two, three, four page patent and uh, essentially the meat is on two pages. I like patents that are this uh, long because it shows that the concept is simple and uh, and here it is. So basically this assists in thermionic emission is as this is in a vacuum this can be uh, tungsten uh, I would suggest that this would probably be better to be tungsten rhenium, uh, but it doesn't uh, matter that much. Uh, and uh, if it's the cold cathode, there uh, are these micro spikes or protrusions. Uh, these are all well known for producing exotic vacuum objects. I have a couple of issues uh, at this stage, I just want to say. Uh, one is if it is the cold cathode version with the micro protrusions, do these wear away? Because um, in other videos that I'm going to um, produce in the coming days, uh, these kind of micro protrusions uh, can um, uh, degrade and, 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 and come apart in certain exotic vacuum object production devices. And so will that degrade over a period of time? Um, that remains to be seen. And the other question is, are the Evos going to go into dark mode and somehow escape from this? That is something to uh, consider. But I do think it is possible that the electrons are effectively being stored in the actual metal. So the next thing I want to do is to take you through a presentation that is on their website for you to download. I have no association whatsoever with Free L Tech. I just found these guys out today and I wanted to talk about what they've done, uh, the patent, and also how I see uh, what I've already shared with the community uh, could be used to improve the technology and potentially even make it into a generator. So uh, Free L Tech designed the vacuum capacitor, a revolution in energy storage. That's the headline. We need a safe, cheap, high density, easily scalable, independent from sensitive resources and environmentally friendly technology that can be implemented massively throughout Europe and globally. We need a real paradigm shift. And so it's got this Mark Twain quote that many have used. They did not know it was impossible, so they did it. And so it's just talking about all the usual places you can use energy. And here it is. This apparently is their current version of their vacuum capacitor. And it's interesting to know, I immediately recognize these uh, drawings here. These drawings come, as far as I can remember, from a Hal Fox who bought the original patents uh, from Ken Shoulders. A presentation that I think he gave in the 1990s, or certainly by the 2000s, but I think in the 1990s. So they, they've dropped these in here, and they're saying charges E minus stored directly as charge clusters inside a small bulb under vacuum. Uh, and these are the targeted parameters. Uh, energy density of 0.5 to 1 kilowatt hours per cm cubed. What? <laughs> After integration, up to 20 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Low cost is less than 100 US dollars per kilowatt hour. Wow. High number of cycles, high round cycle efficiency, small quantities of materials needed, no rare or expensive raw materials, low environmental impact, and simple recycling. Wow. Okay. It's got ticks a lot of boxes there. And what they're saying here is the they have unmatched energy and power density. So, you know, they've got the capacitors, electrochemical capacitors, batteries, and fuel cells all over here. But here, from sort of batteries, they've got two orders of magnitude uh, higher in terms of energy density and uh, a much higher power density uh, watts per kilogram than uh, batteries and fuel cells, uh, almost onto electrochemical capacitors and capacitors uh, certainly within the range of the power densities of those. So this is very, very impressive if it can deliver and truly give these uh, high around cycle efficiency and high number of cycles uh, uh, figures. And what they're seeing here is that it's significantly lower cost. So, you know, they've got uh, lead acid here. Uh, they have uh, pumped hydro. So they're saying it's much, much cheaper to store energy than lead acid or pumped hydro and even lithium iron. So uh, this this is very, very impressive. And you've even got fuel cells here, so much, much, much cheaper. So already they are you know, nearly an order of magnitude 
uh, cheaper than sort of uh, pumped hydro and uh, lithium iron. And they're intending to take that right down to be at least an order, if not more than one order, um, uh, magnitude cheaper. So that's, that's really impressive. 10 to $20 per kilowatt hour by 2025. Our technology is and should remain significantly less expensive than any other technology. Wow, that is, I mean, these are really, really bold claims. And knowing what charge clusters can do, and some of which I shared you over the last several years, um, these are pretty uh, bold statements to be making. So I'd, I'd love to be able to uh, test this device. And so it would see, seem that about 15 years ago, uh, they made some prototypes and so forth and uh, made the patent. The patent was, is, patent was issued 2015 in the US. We're not talking about vaporware here in terms of the patent. These are some uh, tests, I guess. And what they're saying here is this is their current device. Uh, it has a cathode and an anode. And the current weight is 40 grams and they target one kilowatt per device. Now, this is the ceramic sort of uh, single ended tube. And I would suggest, as I did earlier, that this is boron nitride if it's going to be one that has the uh, heater element within it. If it doesn't, then it's less important uh, from that point of view. So you can use, say, um, alumina or, or other high density vacuum capable fully fused ceramics uh here's some other details of what they're doing this is december 2019 to february 2020 this is testing vacuum capacitor in france here's uh, some more of the charge cluster details here and it's talking about what charge clusters are and uh, oh, it's also got evo here and it's talking about the fact that uh, uh feynman first dismissed ken shoulder's idea uh, but in 1986, he sent a letter to Ken Shoulders to recognize that Feynman was wrong and that electron clusters were feasible. Okay. Uh, just a general uh, solution page there. Obviously, once you've got something good, you can apply it everywhere. Okay, so we've got some milestones here. So he's saying between 2007 to 2011, there was first tests and proof of, proof of concept at 300 watt hours per centimeter cubed. Uh, patents filed and so on and here we go in in April 2017 the patents were transferred uh, from the Russians uh, uh, in kind as value to the uh, company which is out of I think Luxembourg and and so on so we are here here and uh, they're they're targeting production um, next year wow Here's the team, and uh, you can see the inventor here, Roman Koloshenko, and uh, you can go and have a look at that in your own time. And that, that's the presentation there. So I'll, I'll just go back to the pattern, actually, because, you know, there's a real potential that you can replicate this really rather easily. Um, at least the test that was originally done, because these 6D, 6A um, vacuum diodes I actually acquired some. In fact, if they are genuinely the same type, I acquired them for like a dollar a piece, including postage, like 30 of them. So, in fact, less than a dollar. So this is potentially something that can very, very easily be tested uh, by people out there and potentially for a very low amount of money. Anyway, I'll just go and dig up the image of that. So actually, this is my title slide, and this is a 6D6A uh, V, um, Russian-made, uh, Soviet-made, in fact, uh, vacuum diode, and it basically has an anode and a cathode uh, and a heater element in there. And I, I, I'm not so sure that this is the two plus centimeters that is quoted. So maybe it's not the right device. Maybe people can find a, a different device. But in theory, you could maybe do something similar with this uh, device uh, in terms of uh, running the test. It's got everything you need uh, for doing a basic test. I actually am suggesting that one might consider some old cathode ray tubes from, say, some dead uh, oscilloscopes, you know, old, old school uh, green phosphor ones. Maybe the phosphor would eat the free electrons and turn it into light. I don't know, 
but uh, just just another concept. But anyway, these things are available uh, from I got mine I think from uh, uh, Romania uh, or Bulgaria or something. Uh, they're on their way, but uh, they're available from Russia and and Ukraine and stuff. And uh, like I say, you can get them for like a dollar a piece. So why wouldn't you? Okay. So what I want to talk about now is how you could consider improving this uh, with some of the things that I spoke about at ICCF uh, 22 that may, may or may not have been picked up on by people. So the, the thing is, is that um, in this configuration, uh, you have a potential to create high temperatures and in that instance, you can leverage the understanding that is in this book and is both calculated and experimentally proven, um, where you, if you go over sort of 1,000 and 1,080 degrees centigrade, uh, you can start to produce cold neutrinos. And cold neutrinos may be the particles that I have referred to in another video that Tesla referred to as cosmic rays or some type of cosmic rays. These infinitesimally small uh, uh, corpuscles uh, that he said were coming uh, from the um, cosmos and were the uh, cause of all uh, radioactivity. And what uh, Alexander Parkhamov has done in this book is he's looked at beta isotopes like uh, cobalt, 60, cobalt 60, strontium 90, cesium 137 and shown that uh, both technologically and um, using uh, focusing uh, telescopes, you can stimulate uh, reverse beta reactions to cause the beta decay or force the beta decay by lensing something that comes from the cosmos or uh, something that you can produce technologically. And the technological way is by taking solid matter and heating it up above 1000 uh, degrees centigrade. Actually, it seems to be about 1080 degrees centigrade. So, could we make our cathode, and even the heater element, but the cathode, from a material that uh, can sustain this temperature and that then would have um, uh, the ability to uh, do some beta emission? So, um, when you are wanting to emit free electrons, one thing you need to look at is the work function of the material that you are using to make your cathode. And this is actually well known in, in vacuum electronics. I want to show you uh, a number of choices that can be made here. So this is what the work function that I've plotted. I've taken the work function data from uh, Wikipedia. And uh, where there is a minimum and maximum, maximum I have uh, placed a blue and a, a red dot. The red is being the maximum. And what it is is that uh, you can have different crystal uh, uh, structures uh, on their corners, they actually uh, emit electrons more easily or less easily. And this actually might, it might explain why in the Lion Reactor some diamond edges produced damage to the nickel, i.e. I'm suggesting that exotic vacuum objects were emitted from the diamond on those edges preferentially to others. So it might actually be related to this work function difference even on the faces of a diamond. If we look here, for instance, if we've got a tungsten welding rod, tungsten can vary from sort of 4.32 here to all the way up to 5.22. So if you're going to want the electrons to be emitted more freely from that, you would want to find something that would do that more readily. Well, in fact, uh, they do add Thorium. The reason you add thorium is it, it, it's got a uh, work function here of 3.4, which is much, much lower. But also it's got a similar sort of melting boiling point uh, or much closer than some other options that you might choose. Um, but there are other options that often get putting welding rods that don't have the radioactivity problems of thorium. And they are lanthanum and uh, cerium down here. So you can see why they may be used. Now they have lower... Uh, uh, temperatures for melting and boiling uh, than does uh, thorium. Uh, so there, there are swings and roundabouts, but you can see why that is. I'm going to introduce something here, which I did talk about in ICCF 22 on my poster sessions, but I think it's very important to share this with you now. On my poster session, I talked about the importance of primordial nu nuclei. So this is something that I had realized 
um, was uh, going to be very, very important in Lena and is almost certainly why uh, alchemists uh, used uh, potassium carbonate, that's naturally produced potassium carbonate from potash, um, and that is because it has carbon-14 uh, in it from the air, and that is a beta isotope with a short half-life, um, and also it has potassium-40. And I talked about this in my uh, presentation in ICCF-22, uh, post-presentation. And potassium-40 is the second most unstable primordial isotope after uranium-235. And so it produces a very high uh, energy beta. In fact, it produces a beta most of the time in its decay. But of course, if we understand what uh, Alexander Parkhamov is saying, this uh, uh, is going to stimulate beta decay rather than positron uh, uh, decay. So this um, uh, is the one that's most likely to occur. So it, would, it is no surprise why you would want 40 potassium or potassium in your alchemy. Uh, and also carbon in the charcoal that they would typically have in there. But there are other beta isotopes here, uh, lutetium, rhenium. So this is why I'm suggesting you might want a heating element that's made of tungsten rhenium, uh, rubidium, uh, and so forth. Now, prior to ICCF22, I spoke to the developer I'm working with to produce the Parkamov online reaction tables, and I asked him to integrate uh, radioactive isotopes into the tables. And I gave a number of examples as my reasoning for that. And one of them was uh, 87 rubidium. Uh, rubidium uh, is used uh, in atomic clocks alongside uh, cesium-137. So there's two types of uh, atomic clocks. And I previously did a presentation about the work of Xu Wenzhu. And they found that in three-body alignments like a uh, lunar eclipse, uh, you have a changing in the decay rate of uh, rubidium-87. And this is because of the gravitational lensing effect caused by that three-body alignment. And that changes the cosmic flux of cold neutrinos, and that changes the beta decay rate of the rubidium. So we already know from data, they didn't know, but <laughs> we know now from the data uh, of Alexander Parkhamov and from Xu Wenzhu's studies between 1988 and 1999, that uh, you can change using cosmic flux of uh, cold neutrinos the beta decay rate of 87 rubidium. So if you can do that using the cosmic flux by modifying that slightly, if you can technologically produce the cold neutrinos, we should be able to stimulate the rubidium here. And likewise for other elements like the lutetium. Now I have done a chart here and this is showing a number of different elements that are at the low end of the work function. So these are all the elements that you would want to consider for putting on as dopamine, uh, doping on the cathode here to accelerate the production of free electrons. So even in your cold cathode version, I would suggest if you're using the cold cathode version, you'd probably want uh, cesium, rubidium, potassium, but actually, the, the, the melting points of these is really rather low. Uh, so you, you would have to consider about your uh, operating temperature. Calcium might be a good one maybe to dope on there as well. But these, these are the ones you might want to consider. And in addition, you have rubidium down here that has 27.83% of 87 rubidium naturally occurring. And what I said in ICCF 22 was that nature is telling you what it wants to do or what it can do by showing you the length of time of these half-lives. So you're effectively at 1 to 8 tellurium here uh, has a half-life that's 160 trillion times the age of the universe. So we can say that this really does not want to decay into two betas. However, we know, because we can measure it in the lab, that uh, 40 potassium does want to decay, and that's because it has a much shorter half-life. Well, if we look at things like uh, lutetium, rhenium, and uh, rubidium, these have uh, half-lives that are, are not too far away from that of uh, potassium. 
uh, relatively speaking, in terms of orders of magnitude. And we already know that rubidium can be measurably observed to change in a three-body alignment from the work of Xu Wenzhu. So uh, these are all kind of in play. And so uh, rubidium uh, is, is an option. But if we wanted to use that in the instance of the uh, thermionic emission here then you need to raise the temperature to 1080, say, degrees centigrade, which I, I have um, calculated. That's, that's far too high, really, uh, for um, uh, rubidium, because then you would start to produce a gas, which would then uh, uh, pollute the high vacuum in there. Now, still, you know, there's nowhere to conduct to because you have the dielectric, but it would compromise the environment. So, I would suggest that uh, rubidium, you know, can naturally decay and it, it could maybe provide some ad additional beta particles going into the environment. Now, when you are looking at the thermionic emission, I am suggesting that you need this high temperature. And the one that sticks out more than anything else is lutetium. Lutetium, uh, if you sputtered that, for instance, on the outside of this electrode, uh, it has a melting point of 1,936 Kelvin and a uh, boiling point of 3,675 Kelvin. And even in Alexander Parkhamov's um, 225-day reactor, he was running that at uh, around about 1,700, around about 1,700 degrees C. So you certainly wouldn't be boiling, even I guess with the very low pressure. Maybe there would be some uh, evaporation because it's a vacuum. But you could operate this really at quite a high temperature. Certainly, I would imagine that it could go over 1,080 degrees C and you would start to produce a lot of cold neutrinos and potentially produce these 1.193 mega electron volt beta particles. And this could then give you again a function where the beta particles are coming out. They're knocking off many more electrons uh, from the uh, surrounding atoms on the uh, cathode. So you've got beta particles coming out at various <laughs> directions. <laughs> Obviously, they're going to be pulled towards the anode. But uh, because the cold uh, neutrinos are formed in the bulk of the material, you, you could have um, a lot of electrons knocked off and evos feed on electrons. So the more electrons that come off, the better it is, the more free electrons that come off. So you could have like a, a, a cascade effect. Ken Shoulders went to extreme lengths to publish E.V. Tale of Discovery and to make his patents open so they could not be uh, classified. And that is now in the public domain. This vacuum capacitor here could possibly be the first application in the commercial domain uh, of a game-changing technology that uses exotic vacuum objects and charge clusters. And in the spirit of that, I am expanding upon what I shared at ICCF 22, uh, that you may be able to use uh, the knowledge that was shared freely by uh, Alexander Parkhamov of how you can technologically produce uh, cold neutrinos to stimulate uh, a sputtered coating or even a doped uh, um, cathode which contains lutetium. And the temperatures here are between 1,936 uh, melting point and 3,675 degrees Kelvin boiling point really give a huge opportunity to be able to produce extra electrons, high energy electrons that could cause uh, avalanche uh, production of electrons that could then uh, uh, yield an excess gain. And you could even have a situation where you had one uh, of these uh, uh, functionalized, potentially generating uh, um, devices and through some electronics, you know, charge one and then that goes through the electronics to feed it and charges the other. And maybe there could be some net gain. At the very least, there's a chance of higher efficiency in charging uh, and so you may find that it charges much, much quicker. And then the amount of energy that you get out is far higher than you put in to uh, uh, charge it or to charge it where it doesn't have the lutetium in place. I've also suggested here strontium. Strontium does have a boiling point of 1655. But 
the 90 strontium, if you use the synthetic isotope, unlike, say, cesium-137, cesium-137 can produce a gamma as well, but the 90 strontium is a pure beta emitter, and that produces a 546 kiloelectron volt beta. Um, this has a 90-year half-life, so lutetium has a half-life which is... Uh, uh, let's have a look at it here. It's 2.7 times the length of the universe. That's why you've got a fair amount of lutetium-176 in lutetium. But uh, this has a short half-life of 30 years. So you could effectively use a waste being extracted from Fukushima and you could put that into your device and uh, uh, produce a higher power output. Now, I'd imagine that this would be for certain uses only, whereas the lutetium is a naturally occurring uh, primordial isotope. It's better suited on a temperature range for the production um, of cold neutrinos. And, and so this would be safe and would not be hazardous. And there isn't really much uses for lutetium uh, currently. Could we use technological means described by Alexander Parkamov in this book to leverage a primordial isotope lutetium-176 to enhance the device uh, developed here by Roman Koloshenko to create the most efficient battery technology the world has ever seen and potentially even a generator. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.